This video is kindly sponsored by Skillshare. Check out the link in the video description to get your two month free trial. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Today we're talking about studying our favorite subject. And I wanna introduce you to the stick method for effective studying. So that's S, T, I, and C, which are the four most important principles when it comes to studying or learning anything effectively and efficiently. S stands for spacing, T for testing, I for interleaving and C for categorizing. And if you can apply these four principles to your studying, it's gonna become a lot more efficient based on the results of hundreds of studies that have been done on students all over the world. The first two, spacing and testing, are probably the most important ones. And then I'll be talking about two other concepts, interleaving and categorizing, that I haven't really spent much time on this channel discussing previously. There's basically like five learning hacks that are really supported rigorously by research. And three of them that I focus on in that chapter are testing, spacing and interleaving. That's a guy called David Epstein, and he's the best-selling author of a book called The Sports Gene, which is all about the science of extraordinary athletic ability. And he's got a new book out soon in the UK called Range, which is about how generalists triumph in a world of specialists, apparently. I've pre-ordered it on Kindle, can't wait to read it. In researching these two books, he's looked at a lot of the evidence behind effective learning techniques, both for studying for exams and stuff, but also for things like sports. And he concludes, much like the authors of Make It Stick, which is another really good book that every student should read, he concludes that spacing, testing, and interleaving are the real game changers. So I'm gonna talk about each of these components in turn, but I'm gonna do it in the order T, S, C, I, because I think that's the order that works personally for me as a hierarchy of importance, but it makes for a less good, a less nice, nice mnemonic. So T, S, C, I is the order in which we're gonna talk about them. Let's get started. If you've seen any of my previous study videos, you'll know that I love to go on about this idea of active recall or retrieval practice, which basically just means testing yourself but they call it active recall in the scientific research papers. But honestly, I think the term active recall can be a bit confusing. I've had so many messages from students being like, how to apply active recall to this? And what, what does active recall mean for that? The answer is, is just testing. Testing yourself is the single most important thing you can do to boost your exam scores by a ridiculous amount. And in fact, in the book, Make It Stick, which again, you should read, and I'll put a link down in the description below, the authors comment that most often when students come to them asking for tips about studying and are not happy with their exam results, the simple answer is that they're just not testing themselves enough. And it's hard to overstate the importance of this. Like some of the studies that I quote in my active recall video show that just testing yourself once is a lot better than rereading the same thing four times. And it's ridiculous just how much of us think that rereading our notes or reading the textbook or highlighting or even taking notes is a useful way to study when it's really not. All of the evidence shows that the more you test yourself, the more the information is likely to stick. The commonest objection uh, whenever I preach this idea of you should test yourself, you should try and retrieve stuff. People often say that, well, how, how do I test myself if I don't know the stuff already? Like surely I have to learn the content first before I can then test myself on it. And my answer to that is firstly, you should check out my video called how to learn new content in which I'd give a 12 minute long explanation about this. But the main point is, as I've said, that testing yourself is integral to actually learning in the first place. In fact, testing yourself is so important that you should be testing yourself even before you learn a topic for the first time. And here is David Epstein talking about that. Basically, testing is wonderful for learning. In fact, you want to test people before they've had a chance to study because it actually turns out it primes your brain for when you then hear an answer to retain it. Even if you get stuff, actually, especially if you get stuff wrong. So there's something called the hypercorrection effect, where if you're quite confident about an answer and it turns out you're wrong, you're more likely to remember the right one when you get it. Again, there are tons of studies that show that testing yourself before, during, and after studying a topic is probably the single best way to actually learn that topic. So yeah, I could go on about this for hours and I have done in my other videos that are linked down below and up there. So you should definitely check those out if you care more about the evidence behind it and about some strategies about how you can apply testing or active recall to your own studying. But now let's move on to the second most important component of effective studying, and that is spacing. Spacing, or what I call deliberate not practicing, is you wanna leave space between bouts of practice of the same thing. So again, if you practice the same thing over and over and over in one session, you'll see progress right away. But what you really care about is how long does it stay? So as David says, spacing or space repetition is the idea that you're spacing out your study sessions such that you've had a chance to forget some of the information before you then restudy it. And hopefully by restudying it, we mean testing yourselves on that information. And this relates to a phenomenon in memory research that's been around since like the 1800s called the forgetting curve. And the forgetting curve is something I'm sure we've all had firsthand experience with. And that's the idea that over time, our memory just decays. So we've all probably had that experience where we're in a lecture, we like, we think we learned something, we, we, we think we've understood something, and then we look back at it a day or a week or a month later, and we're like, crap, where did all that information go? And in fact, since I seem to have become one of these study tips agony aunts on the internet, 
One of the most common queries I get on Instagram DM is along the lines of, I'm in class and I've made my notes and I've, I've studied and I think I get it. And then I just forget it the next day and I don't know why that is. And I think I must be really bad because all my classmates seem to be getting it immediately the first time. The answer to that is no, you're not bad because this is literally how memory works. You're supposed to forget stuff over time unless you re-retrieve that information and re-encode it and make it stick. And your classmates are not getting it first time unless they're the one of the 0.0001% of people who have a genuinely photographic memory. They are also having to put in multiple repeated sessions of learning to actually learn something. There is no such thing as someone who just gets it first time around. The forgetting curve literally applies to everyone, so don't worry if you find yourself forgetting stuff. And as we're talking about in this video, the best way to get this information to stick in the long term is firstly, again, to read the book, make it stick, but also to apply these things of spacing, testing, interleaving, and categorizing. And here is David Epstein again. There was one study, one famous study, where two groups of people were learning Spanish vocabulary. One group got like eight hours intensive on one day. The other group got four hours one day and then the other four hours a month later. They had the exact same studying. One was just separated by a month. Eight years later, they brought them back. And the group that had the spaced practice intervals remembered 250% more with no studying in the interim. And so you have a certain amount you want to study. It becomes more efficient if you space it out. You take time of deliberately not practicing. So this, what he's talking about, is clearly an extreme case. But you see pretty much identical results reported across the entire literature on effective studying. And that's the idea that spacing your study sessions is much, much more efficient than trying to do everything all in one go, otherwise known as cramming. If you want to know more about spacing, you should check out my 26 minute video all about spaced repetition and the evidence behind it. And in that video, I go into some details about how you can apply it to your own studying. But if you don't care about the evidence, and you just want a very quick method that you can immediately apply from today, you should check out my video about the retrospective revision timetable, which is one of my favorite techniques for ensuring that I'm using active recall space and space repetition, or rather spacing and testing to make my studying as efficient as possible, which means I can then do other things with my spare time, like make videos like this. Thirdly, I wanna talk about the idea of categorizing, and that is one of my personal favorite efficient study techniques. I'm working on a proper long video about this where I fully talk about some of the evidence and stuff, but in this video, I'm just gonna give a general overview. And in general, the main point is that if we wanna learn large amounts of information, it's far better for us to try and build a categorization system for that information, try and build a structure around it, rather than just trying to learn the information, which is probably the default strategy that a lot of us would or default to. And there have been loads of studies in the literature whereby they get two groups of students. One group of students just gets told to memorize a list of words and the other group of students gets some kind of categorization system in place for those words or gets told to create their own categorization system so they can lump certain words into different categories. And in the vast majority of these studies, you find that the second group, the categorization group, completely destroys the first group in terms of the amount that the information sticks, both in the short term and also in the long term. Now, one way to think about this is to build what I like to call a tree of knowledge around our subject, around a topic, and that is starting with a, like a main trunk and then building a branches off it such that anytime we get any new piece of information, we're able to hang it on one of the branches of our tree. And I'll give you an example from medical school. So. I used to find the topic of hematology, which is the study of the blood, quite overwhelming because there's so much various things that can go wrong with the blood. But then one day I sat down and decided, you know what, I'm just gonna build a tree of knowledge. I didn't call it a tree of knowledge back then, but that's kind of what I was thinking. I'm just gonna sit down and build my tree of knowledge about hematology. And I realized that looking through the specification, looking through the syllabus, looking through a few textbooks and online resources, that everything within hematology can pretty much be categorized into three things. Problems with anemia, i.e. your hemoglobin levels going too low. Secondly, problems with clotting. And thirdly, the cancer malignant hematology stuff. And then within those, we've got our own subcategories. So within anemia, we've got microcytic anemia, normocytic anemia, macrocytic anemia. And within those, we've got some more categories. Within coagulation, we've got things that make you clot versus things that make you bleed. Within malignant hematology, we've got four things. We've got the lymphomas, we've got leukemias, we've got the myeloproliferative disorders, we've got the plasma cell dyscrasias, and a few other things. I'm, I'm creating my tree of knowledge. And I, I found that since creating this tree of knowledge for hematology, I've started to understand the subject a lot better because now when I come across, I don't know, Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, I know exactly where it fits on my little branch thing. And when I come across Burkitt's lymphoma or something, I know exactly where that fits in my thing. When I come across antiphospholipid syndrome, I'm not thinking, oh crap, what is that? I'm thinking, oh, I know that that fits on that branch of the coagulation tree and therefore this is what's going on there. And so overall, this makes the whole subject a lot less overwhelming. And I kind of wish I'd been doing this from day one of medical school for every single subject. And I wish I'd started doing that before even learning the subject, like 
when I was scoping the subject, which is what I like to call it, i.e. just sitting down with the syllabus and working out what is everything within cardiology, what is everything within respiratory medicine, just taking those one or two hours to sit down and build a tree for that subject would have done absolute wonders for me because then when I get new pieces of information, I'm not just, you know, chucking it into a notebook and hoping that it sticks. I'm hanging it on my tree of knowledge and therefore increasing the chances that I'm likely to retrieve it. There are tons of other benefits of categorization, but I'll save those for the proper video about it. For now, if you're struggling with a subject, if you find yourself getting a bit overwhelmed by it, try and think about it as maybe a tree of knowledge. I found that really helpful in my life. Maybe you'll find it helpful in yours. And finally, let's talk about interleaving. So testing, spacing, and interleaving means just, or mixed practice is like mixing up the things you want to learn. And this again has to do with forming these conceptual models for knowledge. So if you're teaching kids how to learn a certain type of math problem, let's say actually you have the same 20 math problems that has five of one kind, five another, five another, five another. What we usually do is you give them five of type A, five of type B, five of type C, five of type D. You'd be way better off mixing those all together. So again, they will struggle more It'll take them longer, but they'll learn again more how to match a strategy to a type of problem. So this shows up in all sorts of learning studies. You don't want to get to a point where you're finding a certain topic or certain skill easy, because as soon as you start finding something easy, it then means you're not learning as well as you could be. And this can feel incredibly unintuitive. We all probably had that feeling where we're learning something and we're finding it really hard. And therefore, what we tell ourselves is, oh, I must be stupid. I must not understand the subject enough. But actually, if you're finding learning hard, that is when the learning is most happening well. It's kind of like going to the gym. Like if you're lifting weights that you find easy, it's not going to be doing anything for you. But if you're lifting weights that you find hard, then you're gonna be making muscles. And it's kind of the same with the brain. The brain is sort of like a muscle, controversial, but sort of like a muscle. Going back to this idea of testing, the harder you're having to work to, re to retrieve information, the more strongly that information is gonna get encoded. And therefore, learning should be difficult. It should be mentally taxing to work, which is why things like, you know, summarizing your notes from the textbook and highlighting, they feel really productive because they're easy to do and we feel like we're, oh, I've produced four pages of A4 today and it looks really pretty with highlights and stuff. But if you think back to all the times where you've been summarizing notes from a textbook, I've been guilty of, of this myself far too many times to count. It's it's too easy. Like it's a lot harder to actually, actually think about stuff to test ourselves before looking at the book. It takes a lot more mental strain and therefore we all shy away from it thinking, oh my God, if I'm finding it hard, I must, know, I must not be doing it right. But in fact, it's the opposite. If you're finding it hard, you are doing it right. If you're finding it easy, you're not learning anything at all. And again, this concept of interleaving is talked about quite extensively in Make It Stick. So again, a plug for that book. If you haven't read it, you should read it. It's really good. Before we wrap up with some final thoughts, I just want to give a massive shout out to Skillshare for being kind enough to sponsor this video. Skillshare is a massive online learning community with thousands of classes from all sorts of topics ranging from creative arts to entrepreneurial stuff. So things like photography, but also things like marketing and productivity. And you can sign up to the premium subscription for less than $10 a month. And that gives you unlimited access to all of these high quality classes. I've recently enjoyed a Skillshare class hosted by one of my personal YouTube idols. His name is Thomas Frank. He's got what's probably the best productivity themed YouTube channel on the internet. And in this class, he breaks down his own system for productivity and how he uses quick capture and how he deals with email and how he uses various different apps. So I've gained a lot of tips from that that I'm trying to apply to my own personal productivity system. If you fancy checking out Skillshare, you can click the link in the video description and that'll give you a free two month trial in which you can explore all the classes you want and then you can continue a subscription if you feel like it. I'll also put a link in the description to my own Skillshare profile. I am in the planning stages of a series of classes about how I make these sorts of videos. So from the production side, the filming side, the editing side. So if you're interested in that, please follow me on Skillshare and then you can be up to date when I release new classes. So yeah, thank you Skillshare for sponsoring this video and thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video and wanna see more stuff about how to make your studying much more efficient, which means you can get so much more done and also do extra things with your time, you should check out the playlist over there and that'll contain links to some of my best videos about evidence-based study tips. You know, I've had messages from, from thousands of students around the world who've said that those tips have literally changed their lives and transformed their study habits. So you should definitely check those out if you feel like it. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.